This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Wow. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for that. As you can see, we're doing our Mises Weekend show live this week, wrapping up at the end of our 2017 Mises University week. It's been a fantastic uh, high energy week with a lot of great kids from all over the world and some great faculty from all over the country. And I'm very pleased uh, this weekend, as, as last year during Mises U, to be joined by the founder, uh, chairman of the Mises Institute. Please, a round of applause for Mr. Lou Rockwell. Well, Lou, I'd like to ask you this first. We're spoiled. We have so many resources around us. Uh, the digital revolution has made so much information available to us. But talk about the libertarian universe. When you were starting this organization in the early 80s, it, it was quite a different scene. There's no question. It was, it was very, very different. And in the early days when we started the Institute, we were thrilled just celebrating when we heard somebody from somebody either by letter or by phone, they were interested in Mises and Austrian economics. And of course, the question was always, how do you hear about us? So obviously today, today that uh, is, is a very different situation. Um, so we've, we, we, we touch, we've been able to touch the lives of millions of people all over the world. But in those early days, um, it, we were uh, a much tinier minority than we are today. Um, I think... Uh, Really, Austrian economics had been, if I want to say in decline, but it had not been growing um, for some time, uh, especially since the death of Mises. And there was Murray Rothbard, obviously. Um, and Murray Rothbard capable of doing anything as a one-man band, but one-man band would like to have some accompaniment, too. So uh, um, having Murray's help was a tremendous, uh, tremendous aid, having the blessing of Margaret von Mises Mises' uh, widow, who was our first chairman, uh, was a huge help. But absolutely getting people to know about the Institute um, was, was the, big, the, the, big, the big trouble. Um, we were very lucky to have Ron Paul's help. Uh, he wrote about us um, and helped us raise money uh, to his own people, something almost unheard of in the world of, world of direct mail, let alone political direct mail for a member of Congress to write to his own donors about something else. That's how much Ron uh, believed in what we were doing and, and still does, I must say. He still is a, a, a very great supporter. Um, so we tried to reach out to everybody, as we do today, interested in Austrian economics, uh, both in the United States and around the world. We had, um, uh, we wanted to find graduate students. We wanted to find, <coughs> excuse me, undergraduates, high schoolers, um, professors. There were very few professors. There are far more today, uh, far more graduate students, far more undergraduates, far more people in all walks of life, finance and, and law and, and uh, all the professions and uh, who were interested in Austrian economics. And of course, it is, it is um, accessible to the intelligent layman unlike uh, uh, the mathematized business that they give uh, the uh, post-Keynesian and the rest of the stuff that they teach and spread today in universities, which, of course, just as, just as messed up in that area as they are in, in so many other areas, whether it's history or, or uh, uh, English or uh, all the so-called social sciences are, except at places like Grove City College, are pretty much a mess. Um, so that's all the more opportunity for us. And uh, we've grown in influence. And, and uh, it's, of course, the, the web has made all the difference in the world to enable us to have all these books for free and all these papers and all these videos. Um, anybody who's speaking to the people who are watching this online who's not spent some time on Mises.org to see the unbelievable amount of resources that are available to you for free, spend some time. And uh, today we have students who recommend other students. We have, uh, as Jeff pointed out at the beginning of this conference, we have um, professors who themselves were students here. Um, 
and it's just the, the Austrian school here and around the world, 26 different Mises institutes besides us, is, is growing. It's uh, maybe the, the greatest international movement in economics aside from Marxism. <clears throat> so, excuse me. <laughs> Not, so we're, we have much to fight. We have uh, the state against us, as always. We have the culture increasingly in, uh, in Western society against us being subverted by, as Bionic Mosquito puts it, the Gramscians, <clears throat> the followers of, of Antonio Gramsci. So there's a lot to fight against, but there's a lot to fight for. We've got such clarity, such truth, such uh, brilliance on our side. And that was true when just Murray Rothbard was in the room by himself. And of course, we, uh, how lucky for a school of thought to have two unbelievable geniuses in a row. I mean, it's very unusual. Mises and Rothbard, it's quite, uh, quite an amazing blessing, uh, permanent blessing to us. And of course, we're looking for others, uh, unlikely but not impossible. But we've got a lot of brilliant people working. Um, it's just it's very, very encouraging. I think we bother the other side. Uh, you might think they would, their attitude would be, we're on top of the world, Paul Krugman or whoever, we're running everything. Um, their little bit of dissent is entirely relevant, forget it. But there's a reason that we bug them. It's a reason we drive them crazy because they're worried. They, they I think, have some understanding uh, of the fraud that they're perpetuating and they worry about the truth. They, it's uh, the attitude of the baloney to the slicer. They're, they're concerned. So uh, I think I thank all of you for being part of this and being here this week. We look for great things from all of you, people online too, uh, who are members of the Institute or just supporters, friends, or just um, people searching. We welcome everyone, and uh, we're thrilled at the increased attention. Um, I just... We're doing great, and thanks to all of you for being part of it. I know you mentioned to me, and like most of us, you had an opportunity to meet Mises. You were an editor, and you, you've told me not only about his manner, uh, his old world manner, but also about your own trepidation in, in meeting him for the first time. You know, it's, I, it's, I was just thinking today, it was 50 years ago uh, that I had one of the great things happen to me in my life. I had... Uh, my ba, I worked at Arlington House Publishers, uh, the conservative book club, which was the only book publishing house in the country open to anything that wasn't left wing. Um, and we published Mises, we published Rothbard, we published uh, a lot of conservative things too. Uh, Neil McCaffrey, who was the president, great entrepreneur, a great man, um, learned it in, in many, many different ways. And he called me into my, his office uh, and he said, how would you like to be Ludwig von Mises' editor? So I was 23. And <laughs> so I, I was uh, stunned, but of course thrilled. And so I got, uh, we were bringing back into print um, uh, theory and history, bureaucracy, and um, also a new, uh, a new publication by Mises, which was... Um, the historical setting of the Austrian school. And so I got to work with him, mostly with Margaret von Mises. Um, but the first time that I, I was going to meet them for dinner, I was, <laughs> trepidation is not quite the word, I was, I was uh, very nervous about it. And uh, I found both of them to be extremely welcoming. And uh, subsequently, Murray Rothbard wrote about Mises saying that he was a was a gentleman from an older age, uh, just so, somebody representative of an older and a better age, is the way Murray put it. But uh, he was um, charming, smart, um, beautifully dressed, beautiful manners. Um, and I, I could see why he reminded Murray of what must have been true in the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, in the old Europe, before World War I and World War II did so much to destroy him not only Europe, of course, but the whole, the whole Western world. Um, but it was a tremendous experience to work with him. And, and then uh, later when I started the Institute, uh, I worked a lot with Margaret von Mises, who was uh, a tremendous lady. Um, Murray called her a one-woman one, uh, Mises industry after his death in terms of 
making sure that all his books were translated in print, um, and just in, in stirring up interest for Misa. She was very smart. Um, she had been an actress and a, a play translator uh, in, in uh, Vienna before they got married. Um, she was very strong-willed, um, and she, she, she knew what she believed, and a uh, hard worker um, until, until almost age 100. She would get down on the bare wooden floor of their apartment in New York and do exercises every morning. I mean, she was that kind of lady. And, and once when she uh, was going, this is after his death, going to Alpbach in Austria, where they used to go, uh, in the Austrian Alps, um, and Mises, there's a great photo someplace of Mises in his later hose, and Mises loved climbing mountains, and uh, she did too, and so she's going back, back over there, and she takes a cab downtown to get the tickets from Lufthansa, and uh, uh, as she is going into the revolving door, catches her foot, she's thrown to the ground, and this is, uh, uh, she's in the middle 90s by this point, gets up, gets the ticket, goes back to the apartment and takes the flight. And I thought anybody else in, at, that, at that age would be, all their bones would be broken, their hips would be broken. They'd be in the hospital for the rest of their lives. Not Margaret von Mises. And she was just, just uh, uh, intensely dedicated to Mises. Um, it was really a wonderful thing to see. It was a wonderful thing to be associated with her. And um, yeah, you better not cross her, though. I mean, she was a very, she was tough, and um, but beautifully mannered, beautifully dressed, um, and again, somebody from an earlier age. Uh, an honor to know them, an honor to to uh, be able to help carry on their legacy. You know, Lou, I don't want to embarrass you, but there are going to be young people uh, someday talking about how they met Lou Rockwell when they were young, and. I, People know a little bit about your background, but could you just tell, tell us a little bit more about how you personally, first and foremost as, a, as someone coming up through the conservative side, uh, became fully and completely anti-war, and also how you uh, came to accept what we might call a Rothbardian conception of, of full anarchism? Yeah, I did come up through the conservative movement initially as, as a boy, and of course one of the things about the conservative movement is love of war. Love of war. They love war. And uh, it's true today, um, as, as it was true uh, in those days. And in fact, uh, Bill Buckley, former CIA agent who really helped uh, change what the American right, before World War II, the American right had been pretty much, it's not entirely, but pretty much anti-war. Uh, they were opposed to uh, Roosevelt take us, taking us into World War II. And... Um, the intellectuals who comprised it um, bothered all the pro-war people. And just as the uh, State Department, uh, right at the beginning of World War II, set up a special uh, group of historians to make sure that there would be no historical revisionism after the war as it had happened after World War I, when people had looked back at the, the disaster, the horrendous uh, civilizational disaster of World War I, and thought, you know, really this shouldn't have happened, and here's why it happened, how we try to avoid it in the future. Very, very powerful movement, uh, intellectually and, other, and politically. So they wanted to prevent that, um, and one of the things that I think the CIA um, said, Buckley and there were other members of you know, the National Review editorial staff, uh, James Burnham, Frank Meyer, others who had been CIA associated, um, they wanted to change what were then the remnants of the old right, uh, what Mary Rothbard called the old right, from before World War II and make them pro-war. And so there was a, a conscientious effort to purge everybody from the old days, and, um, and it um, I would say pretty much worked, unfortunately. Not entirely, but, but pretty much. Rothbard, of course, never succumbed. Uh, but uh, people died off uh, or were just they lost their jobs, typically the way these things work. So there was a period um, in the 50s and 60s when it was very unusual for anybody right wing to be at a war. And um, I would say it was my reading 
uh, reading people like Garrett Garrett and John T. Flynn, um, uh, as well as, I should mention, first of all, my father's influence. My, my dad uh, was a Taft Republican. And the first, in fact, my first political memory is of standing outside um, in my new overcoat, uh, and he's pinning a Taft for President button on me. So this is before this would be um, in the, you know, the early 50s, because uh, as Tom Woods pointed out, uh, Eisenhower stole the nomination from Taft at the, uh, 50 for the, at the Republican convention for the 54 uh, nomination. Uh, but my dad didn't like war. Uh, probably it had, I think it had, there were some personal reasons, uh, because uh, his other son um, uh, was killed in World War II in uh, what they call friendly fire. Uh, you're dead, but it's okay, your friends killed you. So it's, uh, that had, of course, an impact on him. But he, had a, but he was ideologically affected by the old right, too. And like Robert Taft, he was anti-war. So that, uh, because of him and because of my own interests, uh, I started to read the, the anti-war people. And so pretty early on, I was not a Buckleyite. In fact, I, I, uh, I despise William F. Buckley and everything he stood for. Um, and he was a colossus in the American right. I mean, he really um, bestrode the world. And it's, it's an interesting reminder to all of us how quickly your footsteps did, uh, disappear from the sands of time. The waves come up and you're gone. Buckley was a huge deal. I, I think it's not true anymore. I'm not even sure how much people read him. He was the author of bestseller after bestseller after bestseller. He had a hugely popular television show, a uh, hugely popular speaker at colleges and universities, and uh, published in a very important magazine, National Review. Um, it's all pretty much gone. I think that um, Murray Rothbard and then, of course, Ron Paul are responsible for the fact that there is so much anti-war feeling among libertarians, and among conservatives today, too. Um, not everybody is a follower of the John McCain's of the world. Um, and as, it was, as we're living at a time right now when we have a concerted effort, a massive concerted effort to bring about a war with Russia um, in a way that never happened in the old Cold War. Uh, they love the Cold War, the whole military industrial complex and so forth, way to spend vast amounts of money but not actually get hurt, they wouldn't get hurt. Nobody was gonna nuke Washington, D.C., for example. Um, that's, that sort of thing is, and nevertheless, they were careful never to take things too far, not to threaten the other side, um, but that, all those kinds of, uh, of uh, concerns seem to have no effect in Washington today. They're happy to, to threaten other countries. There was a, the Admiral of the Pacific Fleet just recently said that if he were told to, of course, he'd be happy to nuke China. Well, <clears throat> what, what, what is the point of that except to stir up a war, stir up war fever, and to make the other country think, <clears throat> do they mean it? Do we have to watch out for a first strike? And then, of course, if they're on a hair trigger, it can lead to uh, a first strike. They don't mean to give because they think they're being attacked. Same thing with Russia. Um, so I think, I, think uh, I, I was thrilled when in the Pew polls after uh, the, uh, Ron Paul's last run for president, when they, when they looked to see why young people supported Ron Paul, and they started out thinking, well, it, it's probably pot. <laughs> nothing, nothing wrong with that, by the way. So, uh, but it turned out that by far the issue among young people who love Ron Paul that was most important to them was war and peace. Uh, you guys don't want to do, go through what uh, people my age went through about fear of being drafted to go and uh, shoot people who never did anything to you in Vietnam and maybe be shot. Um, a horrific, these things are, 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 are pretty much forgotten. We all know about the 58,000 Americans who, who died. There's a big memorial to them in Washington. Um, but Martin Van Crevel, the great Israeli military historian, estimates that uh, the U.S. in uh, Vietnam and uh, in Cambodia and Laos uh, killed between six and seven million people. <laughs> Their names are not on the wall in Washington, of course. Um, so could something like that happen to us? 
I don't think North Korea is capable of launching an ICBM over here, despite the propaganda. It's a very, very poor, uh, very, very poor country. Um, but certainly the Russians and the Chinese are. And uh, to, to, to stimulate <clears throat> a nuclear war, I mean, are these people crazy? I guess <clears throat> it seems to me that the neocons, unlike the previous power elite, which we, we can in shorthand say that sort of the Rockefellers, uh, the neocons actually seem to me to have a crazy gene uh, to be, that they would be risking uh, what could mean the end of the world, or certainly the end of the civilized world. Uh, how many generations where it would be impossible to uh, even go into large areas of the earth that used to be cities and farms and, and factories. Um, what, what, what are they doing? So I think it's far more interest, like when I was a kid, in the, in the anti-war cause, Murray Rothbard laid the, <coughs> excuse me, laid the um, ideological groundwork. Uh, Ron Paul, the Ron Paul movement, picked up that. Murray, of course, worked with Ron, loved Ron. Uh, they were very close friends. And um, Ron carries that on. He's got a great uh, institute, the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, and uh, has a daily show. Hope everybody watches the Liberty Report. Uh, which is on uh, YouTube every day, and uh, he's fighting the fight. Virtually nobody in Washington agrees with him. Maybe there are three or four congressmen out of the 435. Maybe there are one or two senators uh, out of the 100. Uh, that reflects American politics, uh, where we've just recently seen, I, I'd like to think Trump is going to veto it. I'm afraid I don't believe he will, but there's another... Uh, horrendous uh, set of sanctions that has been passed overwhelmingly by both houses of Congress. Um, really an act of economic war against Russia that also badly damages Europe because it prevents European countries from trading with Russia. The U.S. is the exceptional nation, of course, thinks it should be able to tell Germany or France who they get to trade with. And so they're forbidding trade with Russia. Uh, this is already, The sanctions have already hurt uh, businesses in, in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe. And uh, now they're really stepping it up. Um, and sanctions are, by the way, acts of war literally, I mean, under international law. Um, and certainly when uh, uh, any time that any Americans have been subject to sanctions, everybody's outraged, and rightly so. It's a terrible thing. And we have all these people in Washington who are always blabbing about free trade, but somehow they think sanctions are great. It's okay to, to uh, threaten people that don't you dare trade. Um, and we see what happened in Iraq because of the sanctions. Um, 500,000 children killed, as the U.S. State Department said, and, and uh, the Secretary of State said, we think it's worth it in order to try to pressure Saddam Hussein to leave office. Well, these, by the way, sanctions never have that effect. If you can think of all the times they put sanctions on, try to pressure... Uh, people they hate in other countries to get out of office. never happens. That's a very strange thing. Politicians don't want to get out of power. I know that's a shocking, shocking statement to make. So um, uh, the U.S., it's, 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 a tough, it's a tough time for anybody who believes in peace because we have the U.S. holding itself out as the exceptional nation. But what they mean by that is the rules don't apply to the U.S. In fact, the U.S. gets to apply the rules to everybody else. The rules don't apply to it. And if it decides to bomb four or five countries at the same time, uh, kill a lot of civilians, um, you're a terrorist if you don't like that. Um, if any other country were doing that without U.S. permission, of course, the U.S. would be bombing them. So it feels it can bomb anybody, it can sanction anybody, it can assassinate anybody, it can drone anybody. Um, and Sometimes Americans wonder why people in other countries are afraid of the U.S. They don't admire it. They're terrified by it. Um, so I don't know what's ahead, but um, the peace movement such as it exists, and we, I think we've seen uh, ever since George W. Bush uh, went out of office, the left-wing peace movement pretty much doesn't exist. There are a few people, but uh, the vast numbers of, uh, when they had marches of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people against the Iraq war, 
It turned out they just hated Bush. Well, that's a good thing to hate Bush, but it's <laughs> but it's insufficient. So um, uh, we depend. We have to depend on libertarians and conservatives who are pro peace to fight this fight. Uh, it's of course an essential fight, and um, it's it's thrilling that there's so many people involved in it, so many people reading. And all you have to do is, you know, just uh, read Rothbard, read Ron Paul, if you've not, on, on war questions. And um, Ron Paul, a man of peace all his life. Murray Rothbard, a man of peace all, the, all, all his life. And uh, they, show us, they show us the way. And this is in so many other areas. I mean, it was still a long journey, I would imagine, from Taft, Republican, anti-war or not, to Rothbardian anarchist, and it's an uncomfortable journey for, for even for a lot of libertarians. Talk about how you uh, reached that. Well, it's true that I was, this is a terrible thing to admit, I was a minarchist. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's absolutely true. And it was, it was reading Rothbard. Um, and uh, it's, when you read Rothbard, and there are other great other great writers before him and after him, um, Molinari before him and, and uh, others afterwards that uh, could help you arrive at an anarcho-capitalist uh, position. But Rothbard just uh, you know, seemed to be unanswerable. And I got also to talk to him in person about these issues. He was very persuasive and uh, in, in helping me understand that the market is capable of supplying anything that's necessary, including defense, including policing, and uh, that having a monopoly um, that decides its own income and decides its own amount of work that it's going to do uh, doesn't exactly work in the, to the public good. Uh, that the state always seeks um, more resources, uh, seeks to suppress dissent seeks to um, um, do less work so that uh, we have uh, you know, a vastly increased number of cops, uh, for example, starting with the, the Clinton administration and uh, just vastly increasing the number of police, and yet the crime rate goes up. Uh, and of course, a lot of times the police are committing the crimes. So it's, it's uh, you just, the, the, you know, it, it, you read Rothbard, you think about about the arguments he's making. I think you uh, and you do so with an open mind. You come to the conclusion that the the greatest enemy of man, or certainly the greatest earthly enemy of mankind, is the state. Uh, that it is a gang of thieves writ large. It operates exactly like uh, a gang of thieves. I don't uh, like to compare it to the mafia because it seems to me the mafia is a much better operation. Uh, <laughs> Uh, they don't wage wars to on other countries, among other questions. Um, so I think uh, it, it really was Rothbard. But it's true that this was very, very politically incorrect, and I'm um, uh, I'm not going to mention the organization. But there's a, a great organization, a great man that I was able to be affiliated with, uh, just as a supporter and a friend. Um, and for them, it was like the, they were libertarians. The worst thing you could be was to be an anarchist. And they ended up expelling uh, Bob LaFave, the great Bob LaFave, and Murray Rothbard, and uh, Baldy Harper, who went on to found the Institute for Humane Studies, uh, for being anarchists, because that was the, you know, you had to believe in the government. And I say from the, and I was affiliated, I affiliated with them even before I, I uh, uh, became an anarchist. Uh, but I must say, immediately struck me as odd, as a libertarian, that the first thing is you have to believe in the state. I mean, well, you know, why? Uh, and of course, ultimately, I thought, well, that's just nonsense. And uh, so I think uh, it's our job as libertarians uh, to tell people about the state, to tell people about the nature of the state. Uh, Rothbard's monograph on the state, Anatomy of the State, is one of those, one of those uh, pieces of writing that's life-changing. You don't. You don't. I, I think you don't read that without being changed. Maybe you don't agree with it, but it affects you. And uh, there are other great works. Uh, 
Hoppe's uh, Democracy, the God That Failed is a, is a book like that too. Um, and I would say all of Rothbard's books are like that. Um, Life-changing. So uh, it's one of the reasons we make all this stuff available for free. We can't do it with uh, Hoppe's book, unfortunately, because of copyright matters. Um, but everything we can make available for free uh, on the web, we do. Because we want, we're in business to have people read these things and be influenced by them. Uh, we have, we're entrusted with a great treasure um, by Murray Rothbard and, and uh, the works of Mises are available to us because they're in, in the public domain for the most part. We have, of course, a tremendous library um, and it's, it's, a, uh, it's a great trust and it's our job to make it available to as many people who, who would be interested in it. More and more people are interested in these kinds of ideas. And um, it's, uh, I also think the whole, in the libertarian movement, the, the uh, strong anti-anarchist feeling is pretty much gone. Not that everybody is an anarchist by any means, but the sort of hatred of anarchists uh, from the days when I was a kid seems to me to be pretty much gone. That's a huge, that's a huge development. Um, so we need to get to the point where everybody's an anarchist. But... Uh, not yet, we're not there yet, but things are much, much better uh, from a movement standpoint and ideologically. Um, but it was, you were a pariah, of course, if you were an anarchist for, uh, for a long time. And uh, people believe in the Constitution. Uh, it's, uh, they haven't read Spooner. And, and uh, other people. Uh, so it's, you know, in the American tradition is, is, is minarchist in terms of the founding fathers and all that. Jefferson, um, in Knox biography of uh, Jefferson uh, talks about Jefferson uh, believing that really the best way to organize a society is the way the Indians did it with no government. But he said that's only suitable for savages, not for civilized men. Jefferson, yeah. Unfortunately, wrong. But he, would, he would, but he, Jefferson had an interest in anarchism, uh, and he thought that the Indians didn't didn't have states, and of course that's correct; they didn't. Um, so it's it's uh, we're making progress. We've got the right ideas, and uh, boy, are they needed. Um, we're living in in uh, maybe we face another. Uh, crisis like 2007 8 in terms of the economy. Um, who knows what the Fed is capable of doing to us? Who knows what the state is capable of doing to us? I must say, as, as much as I dislike the state, it never would have occurred to me or, you know, when I was younger that they would be spying on every single thing we do. Every, we didn't have emails, but every, every letter, every telephone call, every telegram, every, every, uh, uh, Spying on our homes, spying on, on every aspect of our lives, spying on our businesses, spying on our colleges and universities, spying on what we're doing right here. Hi, guys. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh, what, kind of a, what kind of an institution does that? They're not protecting us, by the way, by doing that. For the state, the enemy, the main enemy is always its own people because they're the ones who can threaten it. So that's why they spent so much time propagandizing us uh, in public schools and through the media and, and, and every other way possible. Uh, and it's why they demonize opposition to themselves. And it's why they want to know everything and everybody's thinking and doing so they can crush it when they feel like it, if they feel it's in their interest. The good thing is, as I just mentioned a second ago, they're afraid of us. They're afraid of us. So. Uh, they don't. They don't do everything to us. They would very much like to do, and uh, I hope you've all read De Labuetti's, uh great essay on on uh, um, the Murray Rothbard wrote one of his magnificent essays to his introduction to it. On uh, De Labuetti was a was a uh, 16th century lawyer in southern France, and he had to write under a pseudonym. But he said all the political scientists, political philosophers are interested in 
why, how, do we, how do we prevent people from not obeying the prince? Terrible thing if people are not obeying the, the, the king and his government. Uh, how do we, you know, it's, a, it's, of course, a, it's an amazing thing, an astounding thing that some people don't want to obey. What do we, what do, we do about that? And, and Delaboidi said, you know, the astounding thing is, why the heck does anybody obey? I mean, it's not, in, it's not in our interest. And he talks about how all governments depend on the consent of the governed. And uh, uh, the, the people in the state are a minority, even in a democracy, which on purpose tends to disguise that. Still, the people who are the net beneficiaries of the state as versus the vast numbers of people who are the net losers uh, because of the state. The people who are in the state and benefit from the state are always afraid of us. And uh, they require our consent. Otherwise, they wouldn't be propagandizing to us to the extent. So he said, he said uh, if only people would withhold their consent, uh, the whole apparatus would come down. Uh, Hume wrote about that, Mises, Rothbard. Um, there are reasons, to, there are many reasons to hope. Um, but it's a fight. We've got, and I, I guess it's a fight that's been uh, taking place really through all of human, human society. From the very beginning, there were people who wanted to use violence and force to do evil and to enrich themselves. Um, then there were those who didn't want to be ripped off and uh, wanted to be left alone, raise their families, uh, take care of their livelihood, and uh, they didn't want to hurt other people. So this has been going on from the earliest times, uh, but we have much more opposition today, far more knowledgeable opposition, far more passionate opposition, and uh, it's one of the reasons they want to, super, they want to surveil us uh, on everything. I'd like to think um, um, when I first started my, my website, lourockwell.com, I had a friend who was worked uh, high up in the Pentagon, and she told me that, um, she said, I want to warn you that you're on the list, the CIA's list of sites that they should keep an eye on. And I thought, hey, well, that's a great thing. That's like a <laughs> That's like a medal. <laughs> so they don't like us. They fear us, and uh, we actually don't have to put up with it. So, great, you guys are all prime for the future, is all I can say. Thinking about this, could you give us your definition of the deep state? And do you think, as a result of the deep state, as a result of technology, we are more or less free objectively than, let's say, when you were uh, a college undergraduate? Well, I think that, that uh, you know, the deep state is the uh, this, by the way, this term comes from, first from Turkey, uh, which famously had a deep state, a permanent uh, group of generals and military contractors, uh, people who, had, uh, the secret police, but also the former secret police, who formed a, a permanent interest group, uh, very, very powerful and pretty much running everything. Um, so that certainly developed in this country since World War II. Um, we have a permanent... Uh, permanent group of people interested in war and rumors of war. Uh, vast amounts of money are at stake. Um, so it's, it's, it's the visible people, you know, it's the CIA and the, and the NSA and the, and the Pentagon and, and I mean the Army and the Navy and the Air Force and the Coast Guard and, and uh, I just heard a rotten ad uh, for the Coast Guard today uh, claiming that the Coast Guard, you know, uh, save people in this disaster. They uh, intervene, and uh, I noticed a lot more government ads. It's like the, the Soviet Union, and they're saying how great that they uh, that they intervene in this crisis and save so many lives. And of course, as happens in every single crisis, the government tr they spend most of their time preventing private people from helping. That was in, in all the disasters in this country, whether it's FEMA or the Coast Guard or any of these other agencies. They're actually active in hurting people, but of course claiming. So you've, you've got all, all those agencies. We also have agencies we don't know about. They say there are um, 16 federal intelligence agencies, maybe far more than probably are more assassination agencies than we know about. Um, 
But also there are there's all the, the, the military industrial companies. I mean, it's Lockheed and Martin Marietta and, and uh, Raytheon, and there's a huge number of them. Uh, and in the areas around Washington where these people conglomerate, the, the civilian employees of these companies affiliated with the deep state, it's the richest, by far the richest part of the country. Uh, that's definitely the way to get ahead. Uh, to be spying and killing and promoting killing and spying. And uh, so I think we've seen, uh, in the, in, certainly in the Trump presidency, these people uh, being extremely powerful. Certainly there are many people in the media. Um, there were some great con uh, senatorial hearings held by sen uh, the late Senator Frank Church in uh, the early 1970s. He was a Democratic congressman from Idaho, looking into the, uh, what the CIA was doing as far as the media and what they were doing in every other way. And he came, he came in, these hearings are still available. You can, you can find them online, but he showed that the CIA had people in every single newspaper, which of course was a big deal in those days, the, the uh, AP and the UPI news agencies and television, television stations and uh, uh, they were controlling columnists. I mean, they were pretty much controlling the official media for purposes of, of uh, uh, war and uh, military spending, uh, more military control in the U.S. empire, uh, which, as far as I can tell, they want to run the solar system. I mean, it's not just the Earth. Uh, and they, there are only two countries on Earth of any economic and military significance not controlled by the U.S., it's Russia and China, so who's, who are the demons? They don't like Iran, of course, too, but Iran is not, is, a, is a, by comparison, a small, much smaller, poorer country. Um, but they overthrew the U.S.-installed dictator. That, of course, can never be forgiven. That's, uh, uh, that's why they must be hated and demonized forever. Uh, so he, um, so the, I would say the deep state consists of all the intelligence agencies, the ex-members of the intelligence agencies, all the military industrial companies, uh, their current executives, their uh, uh, ex-executives, um, and also um, higher members of the officer corps, ex-generals, ex-admirals, uh, probably ex-colonels too. Uh, this is a vast number of people. Uh, they have power, I guess, unprecedented in, in human history. Uh, to spy, to control, um, but they're not sure of themselves, and they're right not to be sure of themselves. Uh, again, like the whole of the state itself, they have to worry about about the people. But it seems to me they're they've become astoundingly open um, in the during the Trump administration. And did Trump actually mean what he said when he was campaigning about a new American foreign policy? by not overthrowing other countries, about trying to be, have friendly relations with other countries in the terms that George Washington talked about uh, so many years ago. I, I, I'd like to think so, but I, I don't know. If he did mean it, uh, he surely has been stymied. And open, I mean, an open conglomeration of, uh, of the two parties, um, which also have aspects of the deep state in them, uh, of the media, of course, um, and of people within the government resisting and wanting war. Um, so it's interesting, I would say it's revealed, it's quite a wonderful thing that the phrase deep state is being used. Um, that was un, un, until Trump, even though the phrase existed and we knew what it meant, it was, not a, it was uh, unknown to, to the public. Now it's known that such a, there is such a thing, that such a thing exists. And uh, certainly all the deplorables, as uh, Hillary ca called them, um, don't like the deep state. Uh, uh, they don't, I mean, it's, it's more recent in-depth analysis of why Trump won in the various counties he took and so forth, uh, show that the areas of the country that are, that are most affected by war, where the most kids had been killed, for example, uh, went for Trump. Um, I hope he wasn't just a fraud like every other politician, except Ron Paul. Um, but. Uh, but anyway, the deep state certainly is afraid of him and was worried that he meant what he said. Uh, so we see all this tremendous battle. Um, 
more, but again, with the more we learn about these things, um, the more about, and of course, this is not just something that happened now. Uh, these people are capable of many terrible things, and that's happened in, in uh, American history, whether we, uh, a lot of people think that the Kennedy assassination was an act of the deep state, for example, uh, because of his, uh, his intention to be f friendly with the Russians and not have a, not uh, to, to try to uh, have a more peaceful world. Um, I don't think there's any question that Richard Nixon, uh, who I think was by and large a horrible guy, uh, but nevertheless responsible for detente, that is peaceful relations with Russia and China, that's why he was taken down. Uh, not because he was more of a crook than the other guys, or that because he was listening, had tapes in his office. LBJ did, FDR did, Truman did. I mean, this is, not, this is we were all supposed to think Nixon was new about this. So he, he had to go. And uh, I think there's a lot of evidence, a huge amount of evidence, um, that the deep state wanted him out of there because of what he'd done in terms of foreign relations. So this, this is not a new thing. Uh, it's even more powerful than it, uh, than it had been because of the NSA and uh, because of its ability to listen to us and store everything. Uh, and, uh, I was used to think that they would, tr they would have trouble with, much as they were listening, and they would have trouble storing everything. Well, of course, it turns out that it wasn't true. They don't have trouble storing everything uh, and being able to go through everything in pretty quick order. Um, so deep state's a threat. The deep state exists. Um, it's a self-conscious beast. And uh, of course, it's just part of the entire state, um, which is, I think, again, the great enemy of mankind on earth. Well, we have time for one question left. Uh, Ron Paul gets this all the time. He certainly got it when he was in Congress. Uh, it's a question young people ask. They come to you or they come to Ron and they say, Lou Rockwell, what should I do? I, I care about liberty. What, what should I do? How do you answer that question? Well, I would answer it the same way Ron Paul answers it, which is say, what do you, what do you want to do? I mean, it's not, you, you can't prescribe something for somebody else's life. What do you want to do? What interests you? What is, where can you contribute? Uh, that's just true in the division of labor and it's true in the ideological division of labor. So it's, it's, it's what interests you, you in, but certainly um, to, to be able to answer that question even for yourself, first of all, you have to read. You have to read everything that you can get your hands on. And uh, Mises Institute is dedicated, among other things, to making all that available to you. So uh, the way to answer that question is to just fill your head with as many great ideas as possible, think about them, uh, study uh, what other people have said, what other, how other people have lived their lives, what they've achieved, what uh, unbelievable horrors they've created, and uh, resolve to be different, resolve to make a difference. And, uh, but again, it, everything has to be based on what you want to do, what stirs you, what interests you, um, it could be, you know, it, you can be an, an Austrian economist and uh, teach Austrian economics at a college or university. That's a very wonderful thing to do. You can be a lawyer uh, who's interested in the cause of liberty. You can be a physician. You can be a factory worker. I mean, you can be, not you guys, but I mean, it's that you can be, you know, there's, there's room in any, all areas of life for people who care about liberty. And, um, because liberty is under attack constantly, and I'm sure has been from the very beginning, uh, it needs defenders, it needs promulgators, and uh, you know that's what uh, we look to you and to other young people in this country and all over the world to uh, fight for. Well, just remember, all of you who are young in this room, you are rich in the most important commodity of all, and that's time. So let's have a big round of applause for Mr. Lou Rocco. Thanks so much. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.